Hey guys, I'm here with the very jacked Mike Isratel from Renaissance Periodization and he's just finished his lecture on fatigue stimulus, which is a concept that he's come up with. Now, Mike, we see a lot of people training in the gym and you know using exercises and certain techniques that are probably suboptimal for hypertrophy. And you know, most of these people are you know, bodybuilders and athletes looking to achieve maximal gains. So can you talk to us about how the fatigue to stimulus ratio can actually help uh, individuals better select exercises and just train in general. And you know, we can start off by just defining fatigue and stimulus. Sure. So stimulus generally is like the amount of messaging you send to a muscle okay. for it to begin the muscle growth process. And it can be like, you know, for example, you do one repetition, that's a certain amount of stimulus. You do two, that's more, right? right? Yeah. Uh, and then you can look at it from an exercise perspective. Like if you do very wide stance squats, when you bend halfway down, you get a certain amount of stimulus to your adductors, your glutes, your quads, but maybe not a ton to your quads. If you do super strict, super deep high bar squats, gee, you know, that's more stimulus to the quads, right? And so the stimulus is basically how much muscle growth is okay. being messaged. Fatigue is uh, can be measured at several levels, but it's basically how much degradation, wear, tear, disruption you cause to your various tissues. And a huge quintessential basic of sports science is every single stimulus always and everywhere comes with some fatigue. Cost, yeah. So you, there's no way to get costless because if it was it, any any level of stimulus and no fatigue, you would just train like that exclusively all the time and never accumulate fatigue, you'd be the biggest person on the planet. So that being said, not all exercises and techniques or training approaches have the same ratio of stimulus to fatigue. So some of them, for example, if you take the, as I used in the presentation, super wide stance squats, uh, halfway down with a rounded back, yeah. and you measure sort of, or try to estimate the stimulus to the quads, you know, they, you get some quad stimulus, right? Like if you've yeah, never trained sure. before, or yeah. you'll definitely cut quad growth. But how much fatigue is it? Well, you know, you're squatting halfway down, you're using double the weight or something like that. And you're doing wide stance, which is really fatigue on the hips and, and structures like yeah. that. And you're, let's say you're just a round back squat, so it's really fatiguing to all the connected tissues yeah. of your spine, etc. And all of a sudden, you know, your, your stimulus is here and your fatigue is here. Right. And we can look at it through uh, the lens of, okay, all the exercises we could do for quad training, what is the stimulus they have relative yeah. to each other? And it's just a very proxy thing. It's not like, oh, like we have technical data on mTOR activation. Yeah. We That's could right. get that, yeah. but it, you know, it'd be like, not worth it. Yeah. Um, Especially as PTs and for sure, he's, he's just never going to yeah. get that stuff. So you you get a sort of from our understanding of how exercise works and from a couple of proxy measures that I talked yeah. about, we can get into in a bit. You know, you have like your uh, how much stimulus an exercise gives you, and relatively speaking, how much fatigue it gives you. Okay. Um, and I can get into like you know sort of some examples of how we're measuring stimulus. Yeah, I, I think it's super important because you know the human body can't actually adapt to training unless it's recovered. So people should definitely be taking these things into account. Now, what what are some proxies that we can use to measure the amount of fatigue and exercise is inducing? Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, uh, how much joint stress is perceived during exercise, how much joint stress uh, or joint damage and uh, symptomology remains in the hours, days, and weeks after. Okay. So, like, for example, if you do super wide stance sumo squats and your lower back hurts all the time during and after, gee, you problem. know, that's like fatigue, yeah. right? And, and, and we can also, also use measures of systemic or central fatigue. Um, how much does an exercise reduce your performance in other unrelated exercises? Okay. So, for example, if you do a bunch of deadlifts, deadlifts are known to be very fatiguing. Um, if you do a bunch of deadlifts versus doing a bunch of shrugs, you might get the same growth in your traps. Okay. But if you're doing deadlifts, um, you know, afterwards, how is your bench press or pull-up performance going to go? Gee, you know, you do a couple sets of deadlifts and your performance is down. Like your entire system takes a beating. Whereas with shrugs, gee, I mean, probably just not that not much, so not much. Some, but not as much. So if you're asking the question of like, especially if you're in a fatigue constraint program, like you're dieting, especially, or you're training a lot, you're a relatively advanced athlete, and you're bumping up against your maximum ability to recover, you say, okay, I need to train my traps. What's going to give me the best stimulus bang for my buck, or at least a good one, yeah. versus how much fatigue am I going to have to pay for it? Because every fatigue reduction you can do with an exercise is more sets of that exercise you can right. do to get even more growth for other exercises. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. Um, how about stimulus? What, what are some proxies we can use to measure the stimulus that yeah. we're obtaining from each exercise? Some of them are like brutally simple, but okay. people just seem to just not do. So, for example, do you feel the exercise? Uh, generating tension in the muscle that is being targeted. Like people will do squats 
halfway down with a wide stance and say they're training quads. And I've coached a number of people, there's high level bodybuilders that I'm like, hey, could, like, you know, they're like, hey, can you show me like you're Dr. Mike, whatever bullshit you know, can you show me how to like do this more properly? I switch their position to high bar, uh, move their feet in, put their feet on plates or have them weightlifting shoes, sink it all the way down. They're like, oh my God, like, I feel my quads tearing apart. I'm like, what no shit? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Didn't, didn't you ever figure out that you, the lower you go, the more tension you feel on your quads, yeah. the closer your stance is, so on and so forth. Yeah. And so it ends up being that perceived tension is, is one. Another one is if an exercise is done for high repetitions, do you accumulate lactic acid in the target muscle? Because that tells you you're actually stimulating target muscle. For example, right. let's say you have like a new chest press machine at your gym and you did a bunch of reps with it and your front delts were on fire, yeah. but your pecs never felt anything. Gee, you know, if someone said, hey, is that a good pec? exercise, I don't know, I feel like my front delts are probably yeah. giving out more. That's a yeah. great stimulus for the front delts. Yeah. So that doesn't mean we should always be chasing the burn in the gym, but if we up the reps on an exercise, we should get the burn where we're looking for yeah. it. Here's another really interesting example. Super advanced. I didn't actually cover this okay. in the talk, so cool. a little bonus round. There are repetition specific, rep range loading specific right. uh, stimulus to fatigue ratios. Okay. For example, high bar squats uh, up to about 15 reps have high stimulus to fatigue ratios for yeah. quads. Right. North of 15 reps, we can use the lactic, lactic accumulation proxy. How, what is the stimulus to the quads in a squat that is 25 reps? Uh, your quads definitely accumulate lactic acid, but the weight is so low that your quads usually can manage. Your lower back is going to accumulate lactic acid See, first. Right, you're going to start to just fall over, yeah. and, and, and all of a sudden, it, on the lactic acid test for the quads, we're not getting such good values. The fatigue is still crazy yeah. mega high. Even aerobically fatiguing as well. Totally, that totally, and that's another measure of fatigue is centrally how degraded is your performance yeah. versus at, is it at the local yeah. muscle. Almost. I don't want to say the ideal exercise, but a super effective exercise is one that when you train close to failure, you feel is being limited by the muscle you're targeting. Yeah. Like someone's like, why didn't you do another rep on leg press? You're like, my quads right. stop yeah. moving. The rest of me feels yeah. okay. Instead of uh, I'm struggling to breathe or, or my blow back, back is, you know, like, yeah, I can't right. okay. maintain the technical connection. Sometimes like my joints start hurting too much. <laughs> That's not the good <laughs> reason. Right? Answer, so, yeah. so there's so there, there's a good example of a stimulus. Another one is we. I don't think we should be chasing delayed onset muscle soreness, okay. but delayed onset muscle soreness or just any kind of soreness you experience post-exercise could be delayed onset, could be immediate onset. Yeah. Uh, um, you want to, at some point, if you're going to high volumes on an exercise, to sort of test out to see if it works and of course just part of your normal training and to see if its stimulus is robust. Does the muscle generate delayed onset soreness in what you're targeting? Or alternatively, it, you know, of course it's going to eventually until they get the laid out set yeah. muscle source of theirs. How many sets does it take right. to do that? And are there other muscles that get more sore than that one? Because then their SFRs are higher, and that's really an exercise for a muscle that you didn't plan on training. Yeah. Here's yeah. a really interesting yeah. example. If you do flies with slightly bent mm -hmm. um, elbows, you're going to get soreness in your pecs like crazy, right. and a little bit of uh, proximal bicep soreness as well. If you do chest flies with a completely locked out arm, you can do this as like the equivalent of a stiff-legged deadlift for the upper body. Okay. Your biceps will get sore as hell, but the load will be insufficient for the pecs to get really sore. So you'll do five sets of that. Your biceps actually get sore. It's actually a pretty good bicep okay. exercise if your shoulder yeah. joints can tolerate it. But your pecs are like, eh. Yeah. So it's like if you think that doing them like this is better for your pecs, and you just have, you know, you're like, well, mechanically it should work. Like if you do five sets of it and you get doms in your biceps, but not your pecs, you have some questions to answer. For sure. The stimulus just probably isn't very robust. If it was, then we say, okay, there's a lot of tension throughput in the muscle. It should lead to damage. It should lead to soreness. If we did five or six sets later, my biceps are sore, but our pecs are not. Gee, our hypothesis of a lot of tension throughput is probably just not true. Okay, cool. Now, on this topic as well, so a lot of people um, have obviously hypertrophy goals and they implement deadlifts in their training. So what's your take on deadlift in, in deadlifts in hypertrophy programming? I think they're just done by really stupid people that are morally bad. Right. <laughs> on a serious note. <laughs> Listen you're to that, guys, you're deadlifting. Dead <laughs> so on a serious note, um, another term I didn't use in this talk, but I use in other contexts, is raw stimulus magnitude. Okay. It's really easy to define. You know, the stimulus to fatigue ratio is the stimulus divided by the fatigue. Yeah. Raw stimulus magnitude is just forget the fatigue, how much muscle is grown by any rep or set of an exercise. Okay. Deadlifts may have one of the highest raw stimulus magnitudes of any exercise for like 80 trillion different muscles. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just for almost everyone, pretty yeah. much, right? 
So it grows a ton of stuff. The problem is if you divide it by the fatigue, it gets huntable like crazy. So for individuals that are going for max maximum gains, and to them, fatigue isn't super limiting yet, a deadlift is a very excellent choice in various parts of the training program. For example, it's, it's, this is especially true if you have a client that's limited on how much time they can spend okay. in the gym and how many sessions per week they have and they're after hypertrophy. That, that means to them, recovery from the things you do in the gym is just not realistic limiting factor. For example, you have uh, a client that trains with you twice a week. She's a mother of three children and has her own career. She sees you for one and a half hours per week. Are you going to put her on a shrug machine to be like, okay, we're doing the traps yeah. and then a lat machine to do yeah. the lats and the, no you're going to put her on a deadlift right. and have her do sets of 10 until well, she up. up because yeah. the raw stimulus magnitude is massive right. and then you say well but hold on what about the fatigue she's getting who gives a shit she's there for 45 That's minutes right. twice a week it's never going to accumulate yeah. to anything massive so deadlifts are awesome if you can squeeze them into your program and justify them as you get more advanced your fatigue allotment starts to be what limits you right it's really interesting, almost almost a consensus among high-level bodybuilders is that how hard you can train is no longer a relevant limiting factor. It is can you recover. Right. So if you get up to training a whole lot and you get really, really muscular, at some point you, you tend to notice that if you put deadlifts in your program, the amount of other volume it squeezes out. Like you're like, okay, if I do deadlifts, there's no way I'm getting to do shrugs. Yeah. Stiff-legged deadlifts are out, yeah. so on and so forth. Then all of a sudden you've squeezed out a sum total of stimulus that's higher mm -hmm. than what the deadlift gives okay. you. Uh, and then because you have the time to do all these other exercises, you might not if you're just a mom that works out twice a week, then you're like, man, it's just a better use of my time to go through, do three or four other exercises, get a same amount of stimulus I would from the deadlift, but less fatigue. Thanks. So, you know, and this is people ask, uh, the next question logically is, how do I know if I'm the person for whom deadlifts are no longer really optimal? The question is, this is, and this is there's more technical ways to answer this individually based, but here's the real question. Uh, when you put deadlifts in your program, do you think that it really alters the quality of your training to the negative, other training, or do you feel like you get them done, everything's good, then you finish up your workout? Because if you get sufficiently strong, like my training partner, Charlie Jung, he pulls uh, you know, two, 250 kilos yeah. for reps, you don't just have the rest of your back workout after that. Okay. You like lie on the ground for 20 minutes, yeah. question whether or not what you're, you're doing. And then if you were to do other back movements, they're so hampered by the mass of fatigue that you think, okay, well, um, okay, I got some hypertrophy from the deadlift. Okay. I paid for it. Why don't I go back and try stiff legged deadlifts or high broken mornings for my hamstrings and glutes and some right. of the other exercises or some of the other muscles and see how it affects the rest of my program? You get a real robust stimulus from those, not quite as high as the deadlift, but then you're super fresh right after you finish. You them. Tons of rows, yeah. tons of pull ups. Like the, the sum total of this workout, the productive volume I got, the mind muscle connection I got was just way better. Whereas if you take a beginner and you pepper in all these isolations, you're yeah. like, okay, yeah, something's working, but then you give them a deadlift, it blows them up, and they're like, wow, this is a robust stimulus and okay. they have no problem recovering from it. Sweet. So you don't have to necessarily substitute the exercise though. Like for example, you just said you could do a stiff leg deadlift or an RDL, good morning instead. What are some other um, methods we can use to increase the effectiveness of exercises that may have like a disproportionate fatigue to stimulus ratio? How can we um, yeah, in, um, improve the improve ratio, ratio. Yeah, totally. yeah, without actually substituting the exercise. Totally. So a lot of times that comes down to technique, okay. and there's uh, at least two ways to improve technique. One is just getting tips from someone who knows what the hell they're doing, or putting like your you. own, you know, barely, <laughs> um, or putting your their own critical eye onto your technique. Like you may be ready, you may have gotten used to bench pressing or dumbbell pressing. For example, dumbbell pressing from here to here, which is a good range of motion, but you're like you're chasing PRs and you know you're just trying to lift a lot of weight. Yeah. So what you do is you scrap your PRs, you go into dumbbell presses with a full stretch at the bottom with yeah. a one second pause. All of a sudden, it's less weight, less joint fatigue, you get crazy muscle pumps, so on and so forth, and you're getting a better stimulus. So just that technical change came from you just, you should have fucking known better and you really did. Yeah. Um, or you could get someone to alter your technique. There's tons of people in the industry that are really, really good at looking at your videos and telling you how to alter. A really good personal trainer, somebody from JPS yeah. can look at you and cool. say, hey, you're like, your hips are going to back a lot in the squat. If you just break the hips and then squat down, you'll get more volume division. All of a sudden, people are like, oh, wow, you're totally right. And you're some, you know, you can have a really good powerlifting squat. And there's fundamentally nothing wrong with your squat. It's just not altered properly for hypertrophy for the quads. And this is something that uh, myself and Eric Helms and uh, Jeff Nippert are going to be covering right. tomorrow. Okay. 
in the practical how to, decisions. How, yeah, how to alter exercises that are normal for strength training to make them more optimal for hypertrophy, yeah. which is really another way of saying how do you increase their SFR right. yeah. for from targeted yeah. muscles. So, so you're actually individualizing them to the individual biomechanics 100%. and structure 100%. that everyone 100%. has. And some people have funky like proportions, and you put them on the leg press, and all of a sudden, you know, where they put their feet is all wrong because they're like two meters tall yeah. and they have super big femurs. Yeah. You adjust it to them, and it might not look like someone's leg press like mine when I have like baby legs, yeah. but they they get a huge hit from their quads. Yeah. They feel in the muscles. Another way of doing it, so that's the first way, is just getting technique yeah. tips. The other way is starting with a decent technique and over the weeks letting your mind-muscle connection, your perception of joint discomfort, alter your technique. Okay. So for example, you start hat squatting and you put your feet really close together and your knees get sore and you're like, eh, it's probably not the best thing. You put your knees a little further apart, tilt your feet out a little bit, and in the next week, your quads feel like they got a better stimulus and your joints don't feel as degraded. And so over time, weeks and weeks and weeks, you don't yet play with technique. You're following where you feel it most in the muscle, Fine. where you can produce the most force, get the best ranges of motion, and have the least uh, perception of joint yeah. discomfort, and maybe involvement of other muscles right. is lowered. And, and then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you're slowly improving your stimulus to fatigue ratio, which has been, not only does that improve your performance in the lift, but it allows you to develop a better mind-muscle connection and probably just get more out of yeah. the lift as you do the lift which is a really interesting argument against cycling your lifts all the time. Like right. if you're doing different machines every day in the gym, you never really get to milk the machine right. as well as you could. Yeah, yeah so I guess it's a lot harder to actually progressively overload your training that way. For sure. Yeah. So not only does it easier to progressively overload your training, but even if you're not progressively overloading, if you load the same every yeah. time, yeah. you get more stimulus and less fatigue as your technique improves over time. Yeah. Because and it's one of those situations where some of that's a, you know individually based. Like you could start with a good bent row technique and eventually get to another good bent row technique that looks a little different than everyone else's. And somebody be like, "Why do you do this with your elbows?" You're like, "Because yeah. that's how I feel my lats the most, and that's how my elbows end up not hurting." And a lot of people, when they uh, watch YouTube videos of people who know their stuff, relatively yeah. speaking, or top level guys, and they watch them do certain exercises, they'll say, well, how come? And they'll pick really a small minutia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How come you do this? How come you do that? And usually the answer is, that's how I feel at the best, but it's still within the range of what is safe and effective. But the thing is, someone's like, you know, the next question is, either they ask the question of, well, should I do that? Yeah. Or worse, they don't, and they're just a suit. Well, I should yeah. do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Maybe try it. Find your own technique, and that, that takes weeks and weeks and months yeah. and months of experience. Because, like, this is something that you've developed over the year, over the course of years of training, sure. right? And you've fine-tuned uh, exercises and techniques based on your biomechanics. 100%. Um, it's, also, it's always a work in progress. Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right, well, we'll leave it there. So that's uh, Mike Isretel from Renaissance Periodization. So... Um, you've got a book on hypertrophy actually coming out as well, is that uh, right? Nope, that's not, not for another year, so don't worry about that book <laughs> yeah. just yet. Well, look, um, <laughs> we have a diet app. Yeah, there we go. It's a coach in your pocket, AI powered, designed by me yeah. and a couple other folks, and yeah. it works really well, awesome. uh, and it's really cheap. And then we've got all kinds of other great stuff, renaissanceperiodization.com. Buy stuff, I need more money. Yeah, and make sure you get onto that hypertrophy book, because it's definitely something that I want to read. Yeah, uh, soon. <laughs> the rough draft is finished, we just have to collate everything, and it takes a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure it does. All right, guys, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Dude, good interview. Thanks so much. No I was going to shake your hand with this, but I had oh, a, a dumb situation. Really? <laughs> yeah, I took my gum out. Right away, you don't say. That's up. As one who's on camera, I'm going to probably won't even be used. Because it's like, so on Friday, our motto here is going up against Lyndon in a bench off. Oh. Do you, you know about that? Have you heard about the big event? Oh, no. This is, so, this is big time. <laughs> when is it happening? Friday. On Friday. So... Coming up next Friday. Yes, 11 a.m. I believe. Yep. JPS and West. Do you a have a preferred person who you think that is going to take out the top honor? And b do you have any tips for Marty leading in to minimize his fatigue? My uh, pick for who's going to win <laughs> is kind of like um, you know. This is like a real bottom feeder competition. Right. So everyone's kind of a loser. Yeah. It's like you, you, you like see like earthworms in the sun after a rain and they're drying to death and you're like, which one's gonna die last? Okay. Like that's the equivalent of this competition. I hope to that's me. Linden. Yeah. Linden's like the more pathetic earthworm. That's right, yes. So like if you look at all the earthworm someone morphology, just, yeah. you know, you're like, geez, I, I'm not an earthworm expert, but that looks like a pathetic bottom that's earthworm. Linden, yeah. That's a Linden totally. earthworm. I've got you all day. Um, unless Lyndon hears this and then Lyndon, babe, I got you.
You're my Finally, man. someone resonates with my right. feelings. And then as for fatigue management, I think the best form of fatigue management is at beginning, when's the competition? What time is it at? 11 a.m. 11. At 10 a.m., you go to JPS. Mm -hmm. It's held at JPS. Yep. You go into the bathroom. You get into the mirror. You lock the door. Right. Okay. And well, you begin to stare at yourself and yell as loud as you can. The kind of yells that Paleolithic man gets chills in his <laughs> okay. spine from. And, notes, yeah. and yell for as long as you can, preferably all the way up to 10, 59, 59. As soon as 11 o'clock starts, run out of the bathroom, tackle Lyndon. Try to hurt him with your hands. I was thinking of ways to sabotage his... Sabotage his is, okay. is the thread that links all exactly. competition. Awesome. So um, poisoning him might be an option. Um, I can I hang out with him this weekend. I can probably slip something yeah, in. That'd be cool. um, <laughs> if you can arrange for a drug test to be performed and slip him banned substances, another great. The thing is, if he passes the test, then he's been on banned substances. Uh, You're probably sure. going to lose. That's a bit of a gamble. Um, just generally sending him social media input that's very derogatory, very negative, saying, you know, you're a piece of shit, like, you should have never competed against me, why would you even do this, you suck. Um, all that stuff, I think, is really just the tip of the spear. Of I haven't done much of that, so I think it's... I, I, yeah, it's it, shows your <laughs> it shows your naivete in competition, yeah. but I think you're intelligent enough. Remember, you're the more robust earthworm in this case. I think you're going to start, and then you're going to find that, that this is your path to victory. All right. Thank you, Mike. Absolutely, anytime. I'm really looking forward to it now. Yeah? <laughs>